there are at least three factors that are going to govern how quickly you transition from ingesting food to a fasted state. Remember, as you ingest your last bite or sip of calories, that's not when the fast begins. That might be when the fasting begins on your watch or on one of these apps that I'll refer to later, which can help you track your fasting and eating windows. But that's not when it actually begins because your body is still seeing food. You're actually carrying around food inside of you. Even though you're not putting it into your mouth, you're still eating in some sense. So it should be somewhat obvious that very large meals are gonna take longer to digest than very small meals. So that will impact how slowly or quickly you migrate from a fed state to a fasted state. A large meal with a lot of fats is going to take five or six hours. A smaller meal with less fat is going to be digested more quickly. Uh, consuming calories in liquid form is going to mean that gastric emptying time is going to be faster. And then of course, there's the glucose and the insulin aspect to it, which is that foods that lead to big steep rises in glucose, like pure sugars, then your glucose will drop. However, if they're combined with fats, then it tends to be a more gradual rise in glucose and it's more sustained, et cetera. Fibrous foods will also create a more uh, long-lasting sustained release in glucose. The important thing here is to establish a feeding window that you can comfortably manage, okay? Meaning that on average, you can obey a six hour feeding window or an eight hour feeding window or a 10 hour feeding window. And then to place that feeding window in a social and life context that you can manage on a regular basis. Okay, so as we build forward your ideal fasting slash time-restricted feeding schedule, we now have several different rules that we can list out. First, at least no food for the first hour after waking up, at least one hour. Two, no food intake for two and ideally three hours prior to your bedtime. Three, if you want to select an eight hour feeding window, then you should probably focus on a six or seven hour feeding window because in reality, your feeding window is going to be longer. Reality meaning real life constraints. And if you'd like to be on a 10 hour feeding window, you should probably select an eight or a nine hour feeding window because the way it plays out is that people almost always eat outside of their eating window somewhat. The other nice thing about selecting a slightly shorter eating window than is comfortable for you is that it takes into account that as you take your last bite or your last sip of calories, there's this time or taper before which you are actually in a fasted state. And because you're eating different things on different days, presumably, some foods leave your gut more quickly, some things spike your insulin and your glucose more than others. Sometimes you eat more fat, sometimes less fat. This allows you to fall well within the margins of the benefits of time-restricted feeding that have been demonstrated in humans, which generally involve an eight-hour window or so. So, so the eight-hour feeding window seems to be very beneficial across almost all the parameters that we've discussed, inflammation, weight loss, fat loss, et cetera, and adherence, I should mention. People's ability to stick to the diet seems quite good on this eight-hour feeding windows, but when people try and undergo very short feeding windows of four to six hours, it seems that they are overeating in that four to six hours, at least overeating with respect to their metabolic needs. Now, the contrast to this is the so-called one meal per day schedule. Very few studies on one meal per day. One meal per day, unless it's a very, very long meal, a sort of feast, typically would not last four to six hours. I guess it sort of depends on how you define a meal. But when you look at the very few, I should emphasize again, very few studies on one meal per day, people typically maintain or lose weight on the one meal per day schedule. So what we can say is that the seven to nine hour feeding window produces all of the major health benefits of time-restricted feeding, as well as being pretty straightforward for most people to adhere to on a regular basis. And on a regular basis turns out to be very important. I'll get back to that point in a moment. Whereas the four to six hour eating window doesn't seem to serve people as well as say a seven or eight hour eating window, simply because people are overeating during that eating window. And the one meal per day, while perhaps ideal for certain people's schedules, may actually cause people to undereat. And in some cases that might be what people want. They actually want to undereat. But when we start thinking about performance in work and in sport, and when we start considering hormone health and hormone production, fertility, 
that's when we can really start to look at the seven to nine hour feeding window versus the four to six hour feeding window versus the one meal per day type feeding window with some different objectivity. We can start to look at it through a different lens because it turns out that when you place the feeding window and how long that feeding window is actually will impact a number of other things, in particular hormones that can be very important for a number of things related to sex and reproduction, can be related to performance at work, performance in athleticism, and there are excellent studies on this. So let's explore those now. So let's talk about some conditions where having the feeding window early in the day would actually be very beneficial. There was a study that was published recently in Cell Reports, again, Cell Press Journal, excellent journal, peer-reviewed, that looked at the distribution of protein intake in different meals delivered either early in the day or later in the day. And I'm summarizing here quite a lot, but I should mention that this study was performed in both mice and humans, same paper, mice and humans, and involved hypertrophy training, essentially increasing the weight bearing of given limbs to try and induce hypertrophy, which is the growth of muscle tissue. It does appear that muscle tissue is better able to undergo hypertrophy by virtue of the fact that there's better or enhanced protein synthesis early in the day because of the expression of one of these particular clock genes called BMAL, B-M-A-L. BMAL regulates a number of different protein synthesis pathways within muscle cells such that eating protein early in the day supports muscle tissue maintenance and or growth. And in this study, they also looked at the effects of supplementing so-called BCAAs, branch chain amino acids, which is popular in uh, bodybuilding circles and in strength training circles. And BCAAs are essential components of a number of different foods, but can also be supplemented. The takeaway of this study is pretty straightforward, however. The takeaway is if your main interest is maintaining and or building muscle, then it can be beneficial to ingest protein early in the day. You would still want to obey this, what we're calling a kind of foundational rule of no, not eating any food for the first hour post-waking or at least the first hour post-waking. And the cutoff for when you would want to eat protein would be sometime before 10 a.m. And there I'm averaging across a number of different situations. But in general, this BMAL expression is such that let's say you wake up at 7 a.m., your main interest is in uh, hypertrophy or maintenance of muscle. Then you would want to ingest some protein sometime before 10 a.m. But obviously, if you're interested in getting the health effects of intermittent fasting, that you wouldn't ingest any food uh, for the, at least the first 60 minutes upon waking. Now, it's not as if at 10.01 a.m., a gate slam shut and you can't generate hypertrophy. Of course, that's not the case. However, it's very interesting that it doesn't matter when the resistance training, the load-bearing exercise occurs in the 24-hour cycle. So whether or not, in other words, people are training early in the day or they're training late in the day, it still appears that ingesting protein early in the day favors hypertrophy or that one is better or I should say more easily able to access hypertrophy by way of these clock regulated protein synthesis mechanisms by ingesting protein early in the day. In no way, shape or form does this study say that ingesting protein later in the day is somehow bad for you. It just emphasizes the positive effects of ingesting protein early in the day for sake of muscle maintenance and or hypertrophy. So if you're somebody who's mainly concerned with muscle maintenance and hypertrophy, then it may make sense to move that feeding window earlier in the day. And certainly there are people out there who are interested in muscle maintenance and hypertrophy who aren't doing intermittent fasting at all. And that's also perfectly fine, but this just so happens to be an episode about intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding. There are, of course, modes of eating where one eats small meals spread throughout the day or weights meals differently such that meals early in the day are larger than later in the day or vice versa. There are a near infinite number of ways to organize this. But if you are somebody who's interested in deriving the many clearly established health effects of time-restricted feeding and you are somebody who would like to maintain or build muscle, then ingesting proteins in the early part of the day would be important to you. 
at least on the basis of these results. And therefore, that eight-hour window that we've established as more or less ideal shifted to the later part of the day might not be as beneficial for you. How is it that one can move their feeding window or place themselves onto a different schedule of intermittent fasting? And it's very clear that one needs to provide a transition period in order for that to happen. You should allow yourself a transition period of anywhere from one week to 10 days in which you shift your feeding window by about an hour each day or so. And then once you establish a feeding window that feels comfortable for you and that you think you can maintain over time, that you simply maintain that feeding schedule for at least 30 days, but ideally you would do that indefinitely. One of the findings that's really been important to note is that almost every individual has a lot of drift in when that eating window resides in their 24 hour period. In particular on the weekends, people are either extending or shifting their feeding window in a way that makes it seem that they've traveled to another time zone and are eating according to another time zone. And this is extremely important. As I mentioned earlier, based on the 2012 study from Sachin's lab, where eating at a particular phase of each 24 hour cycle can help enhance the expression of these clock genes. If you are eating within a very strict or semi-strict feeding window, but that feeding window is migrating around from day to day or five days a week, you're really organized about when that falls. Let's say for sake of example, from noon to 8 p.m., noon to 8 p.m., Monday, noon to 8 p.m., Tuesday, Wednesday, noon to 8 p.m., Thursday, and so forth. But then on a Saturday, it's becoming 11 a.m., and you're ending it early, or perhaps you're starting early in the day on Sunday, you're having brunch that starts at 9.30 or 10, and then it's extending out still just eight hours, but it's shifting around, that can cause disruptions in these circadian clock mechanisms that cause disruptions in the downstream effects of eating that are taking at least two to three days to recover from. So, Obviously, we don't want to be overly neurotic about this stuff, but because this is an episode about the science of intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding, as important as how long your feeding window is, is where that feeding window resides in each 24-hour cycle. And perhaps even more important than that is that it be fairly regular where that feeding window resides. Because even if you have a very short feeding window, if it's drifting around from day to day, that actually offsets a number of the positive health effects of intermittent fasting. So to really just underscore the way that these different pieces of the biological puzzle fit together, most all people could benefit from a time-restricted feeding schedule, but they should really think hard about what they can stick to on a regular basis and understand that they tend to underestimate the feeding window that they actually are partaking in and that they should place that feeding window in a portion of the 24 hour cycle that they can be consistent on most days. When you eat, there's some period of time afterwards in which you're actually still eating, at least from the perspective of metabolism, because glucose is up, insulin is up, and you're undergoing different metabolic and digestive processes that don't really speak to you being in a fasted state, right? It's not just about when you take your last bite or your last sip. However, There are things that we can do to accelerate the transition from a fed state to a fasted state. And so I'd like to discuss what those are. And I want to emphasize that the term fed state is probably a better way to think about it than eating or not eating. Because we think of eating as the verb. We're eating, we're eating. Okay, we're done eating. I'm fasting now. But you're not actually fasting because you are fed. So we should really think about fed and unfed states because from a cellular processes perspective and from a health perspective, that's actually what your body and your system are paying attention to. And by now, with everything that we've laid out, I think that should be intuitive to understand. So there's a fun and exciting concept related to this, which is glucose clearing. You may have heard the old adage that if you take a 20 or 30 minute walk after dinner, that it accelerates the rate at which you digest that food. And indeed it does. Clearing out of glucose from your system can be accomplished through a number of different means, but light movement or exercise does 
increase gastric emptying time. So for instance, if you were to eat a meal that ended at 8 p.m. and to, and then plop to the couch, watch TV or get on your computer or go to sleep, it would be five or six hours until you have transitioned from a fed state to a fasted state. However, you can accelerate that considerably by taking a 20 or 30 minute just light walk. It doesn't have to be speed walking. It certainly doesn't have to be jogging, but just walking outside or moving around. So glucose clearing is an important aspect of the transition from the fed state to the fasted state. And just a light walk can allow you to do that. Now, if you can't get outside, some people will go um, through the gymnastics, literally of doing things like air squats and push-ups and things like that. And indeed, those will increase the expression of things like glut four and things that mobilize glucose into muscles and things of that sort. But you know, under most conditions, most people aren't doing push-ups after dinner, or certainly if you've had a big meal, just taking a light walk can be beneficial. In addition, you could consider doing intense exercise. Now, you wouldn't necessarily want to do that immediately after eating. So let's take a look at what high intensity training of any kind does to blood glucose. Because in this case, it turns out that when you do high intensity training actually has opposite effects on blood glucose, depending on whether or not you do it early or later in the day. So a fairly recent study looked at so-called HIT training, high intensity interval training. When you look at the studies that have explored high intensity interval training and its effect on blood glucose, there are a couple studies that leap out. For instance, one that emphasized that blood glucose levels will actually increase if high intensity interval training is performed early in the day and will decrease if high intensity interval training is performed later in the day. Now, the purpose for this exploration was not to explore clearance of blood glucose for sake of intermittent fasting. It was mainly focused on athletic performance and whether or not that was better early in the day or later in the day, et cetera. But we can extract some information from these studies that are beneficial for sake of understanding glucose clearing. If you have ingested food throughout the afternoon and evening and late in the day, and you're thinking about going to sleep and you'd like to enter sleep in a way that is less fed and more fasted, then engaging in high intensity interval training in the afternoon will lower, or evening I should say, will lower blood glucose. And in that way will help you accelerate your transition into the fasted state, provided you don't ingest something after the high intensity interval training. Now, is the increase in blood glucose that occurs from high intensity interval training early in the day, is that detrimental? Not necessarily so. That oftentimes is associated with the shuttling of nutrients to the muscles that have just done a lot of hard work. So it's not that high intensity interval training should not be done early in the day. In fact, for many people, including myself, training early in the day, just for the way that my psychology and biology works is always better for me than training later in the day. And the other important thing to mention is that high intensity interval training done late in the day can be beneficial from the perspective of glucose clearing, lowering blood glucose and helping transition from the fed to the fasted state in preparation for sleep. What we are really trying to achieve when we partake in intermittent fasting, so-called time-restricted feeding, is what we're really trying to do is access unfed states or fasted states. It's not really about when you eat and what you do. It's about extending the duration of the fasting period as long as you can in a way that's still compatible with your eating, right? Not the other way around. And this gets back to this key feature of our biology, which is that what we eat, when we eat, when we exercise, when we view light, it's about setting a context or a set of conditions in your brain and body. So it's not so much about the activities that you undergo, it's about the activities you undergo and their relationship to one another over time. And so in this way, it really beautifully highlights the way that your biology is interacting all the time. Light is setting when you're going to be awake and when you're going to be asleep. When you eat is going to be determining when you're going to be awake and when you're going to be asleep. And when you eat is also going to be determining when you are able to clear out debris from your brain and body and repair the various cells and mechanisms of your body, when you're able to reduce those inflammatory cytokines throughout your body. And this is really the beauty of time-restricted feeding, which is it's not really about restricting your feeding. It's about accessing the beauty of the fasted state.